So, how's everybody doing? Everybody feeling energy from after lunch? Too warm in here? It's a little bit too warm in here, okay. So today I will be talking about creating a culture of innovation, primarily using a headless CMS as the driver. A quick little bit about me is I am a developer advocate for Graph CMS. We're a headless CMS and we're based primarily in GraphQL, so everything is through that query language. I'm not talking about GraphQL today, so if you have any questions about that, definitely ask me afterwards. I'm happy to answer them in person. I'm a husband, I'm a father, which means I'm qualified to tell really bad dad jokes. And I'm also an American, which means I tend to talk a little bit too fast. So if I'm speaking English too quickly, just give me one of these like panic signs and I'll slow down a little bit. I'm also uh, working on being a nice guy, but you know, you know how it goes. Two main goals for today is to get everyone in the room to use a headless CMS, hopefully this one. And the second room is to get a room full of Finnish developers to laugh. Seriously, guys. Okay, there we go. Okay, goal number one is accomplished. We'll work on number two by the end of the talk. So what we'll learn today is my definition of an innovative culture. I spent some time in Swiss banks and helping them kind of create culture of, cultures of disruption and various features for, for technology. Uh, just some, some observations I've had from research and putting them together. What is a headless CMS? Does any, anybody actually not know what a headless CMS is? All right, good. Yeah. We, well, some people will learn stuff. Good. Uh, and then the modern product stack, and you'll also learn that I do tell dad jokes. That part is true. So culture of innovation, what do I mean by that? Basically, you have your core business model, right? You got your, your concern, you have your domain of expertise, and then somebody has an idea that says, hey, I think this may actually bring some value to the company. So you have some little thought process that gets started in the corner, and immediately then you switch the prototype phase. You have to get stakeholder buy-in. You have to get people in the company to actually say, yes, this is worth putting money in. Some of the key principles in this phase of getting, uh, uh, getting the buy-in from, from uh, stakeholders is it needs to use real data. So if you're creating a prototype with just dummy data, it's not a real world con uh, use. You're not gonna be able to see if this actually has application for the customer. And many, many, many companies already fail at this part. You need to actually give it a real world context when you're showing somebody. Facebook actually created an app for the designers to actually pull in randomized data from users because when you're talking from a designer perspective, it's all beautiful people with really fascinating lives on their profile wall, but then the rest of us aren't so interesting. So when you're trying to look at what the profile wall looks like, you need to use real data for creating, uh, creating a prototype it needs to be able to demonstrate feasibility already in the prototype phase. Can this thing be made? And then the third step is you need to identify the KPIs at the prototype phase so that when you switch to the MVP process, you're able to start to measure it aggressively. Say, is this thing actually working? I was talking with some guys last night about the Chrome uh, process. When the Chrome browser was created, their, their MVPs or their, their KPIs were terrible. Everything they had initially thought about creating was a disaster until they realized that they had completely conquered the browser market pretty much overnight. And so then they switched their KPIs to saying, well, now we have a new, a new initiative. So it's okay to switch a KPI if you have something clearly measurable, but you have to be measuring everything aggressively, and it has to be part of your, your main business process. Also, a key note here, uh, failure and failure due to incompetence should not be correlated when it comes to measuring an MVP. That's always a very critical step. I was in a lot of processes where an app actually didn't make it, and that was just because it was executed badly. The idea was good, but the app actually wasn't. And so these two need to be very clearly defined about what is actually uh, the fault uh, for a failure. So then the third step for a culture of innovation is then that product or the idea gets developed into the core business. And in the perfect world, then that cycle proves successful. It becomes kind of this held up icon, says, look what we created inside of the company, kicks off more innovation, more dreamers, and you create uh, new and new products. And it's a, it's a beautiful process when it works. <laughs> so if any of you have actually been inside of an innovation circle, it's not always quite like this. And there's some key areas where this process tends to fall down. So you have your, your core business, and then you go to the prototype phase. Prototype needs to be built quick. Data tech uh, stack and team diverge from core. This is the most common case. 
So you have somebody who's taking a monolithic stack of data, maybe a CMS or whatever else you have, and then they want to make this prototype work, so they start developing a silo, a new stack of content and tooling and everything else to actually make this prototype work. And you start to get this separation in the company, you have main business and then you have the, the CMS and the databases and everything else for the prototype are completely becoming separate from your core business. And this is the first, the first area where it falls down. The second area is that then the reporting measurement also diverts from core. So now you have a situation where you have data and tooling and software is different from everybody else in the company. And then in that case, you also end up having your measurement methods and all of your analytics and tracking also different from core. And you're losing the ability to actually say, is this thing actually going to be a cost driver or is this going to be a revenue generator? And this is the, the number one killer of all kind of innovation cultures is when these two things diverge. And at some point, there's basically this little moon floating around your core business. Nobody's quite sure who's exactly responsible for it, who needs to be you know, fired for it, or is this thing even making us money or is it costing more money to run? Because they're completely isolated from from each other. Nobody has a good overview of both, uh, both circumstances. The better way is when you actually have your core business, your data and your infrastructure, not separated from, your, from this prototype idea, but when you're sharing the resources. So if data and your infrastructure are living as sort of a, a shared platform that your core business is feeding off of and then any of your future innovative ideas are feeding off of, then you're able to, to really accurately measure what's happening, what's going on. So it's a really great situation, but that's where we need to uh, switch to then how do we get data shared. So we have what I like to call hedging with headless, and that's where going with a headless CMS allows you to share data between these different products and features. And if you can't see it, that is the one ring to rule them all. It's a dad joke? Nobody? Okay, good. Sorry. They're not all winners, it's okay. Am I losing anybody already? Am I talking too fast? Slow down? Good? Everybody's good? All right. What is a headless CMS? A headless CMS is a content management system that delivers content strictly via API. No front end or render engine, aka headless. So you have the back end and the front end, and the front end is often referred to as the head when it comes to a content management system. And the reason why this is helpful is that Content is everywhere today. And so the traditional CMS was designed and optimized for websites. That was, it was solving a very clear problem. Well, now the CMS has to be working with new touch points. And these aren't exactly friendly when it comes to drag and drop interfaces. If you try and drag and drop anything with Alexa, it's like, cannot compute. And why that matters is that when you have a centralized content hub, you're able to then distribute specialized content for the individual platforms. Both more or less audio devices, one is a visual aid with it, one is not a visual aid, and so you need to be able to tell content, all right, you're allowed to go here, you're allowed to go there, and not be sending excessive data down the pipeline. This is actually where my company specializes in with GraphQL because it allows these individual clients to, to query their content uh, specifically, so in this case, it's able to request content without <coughs> pictures, and in the other case, it can ask for, for content with photos, and in the case of the uh, Google Home here, it's able to save megabytes of data going down the wire by not having to query this excess data that it can't actually do anything with. There is a, uh, a second term growing in the headless content management space called the hybrid CMS, and what that usually means is that you have your traditional content management stack, so you have something like Drupal or whatever else it may be, Drupal's a great product, I'm not knocking it, uh, and then they have an API layer that you can actually pull data out of as well. So if you wanted to work with, say, uh, some kind of a Flutter application, you could pull data out of your Drupal backend and be able to work with. The reason why I'm not a huge fan of hybrid cases is that even in the hybrid case, the CMS implies a lot of um, opinion about what your projects need to look like. There are a lot of projects where websites are the last thing that you're actually really building. You might have one landing page for like a, a marketing landing site, but you don't actually need to have specialized slug types or specialized page types. 
that's just adding excess of opinion that you're going to have to work around as developers. And your developers are going to slow it down because they're going to try and hack the underlying models and try and get it optimized for your field. In a true headless CMS, you're defining the complete model in all the fields exactly the way that you want it to be. And the reason why that's important is that content looks different today. I mean, a smart planter, like it needs different kinds of data. So if you wanted to try and tell an existing page-based CMS how to give your poor plant some water, that's it's a, it's a sad day in plant land. So the main benefit of then of what a headless does is the headless supports not only your existing mission critical apps, but it also <coughs> is able to support tomorrow's MVPs. And so when you want to have your existing business running and you have all your content in place, you can start to feed into this established updated, maintained content database to then power future applications and future ideas. Again, merging these two sources together, sharing them across ideas and core services, not creating silos of content that are specialized for one individual thing. So how does the modern stack tend to look? So the product flow. Usually you start off with the prototyping and the MVPs. You'll oftentimes have marketing efforts and need for landing pages and various other services. You have your mission critical apps and services. These would be your actual main website if you have e-commerce or whatever else in place. Uh, these would be the, those existing services. And then you have your integrations. So if you have some kind of a serverless setup, if you have a microservice in place, those live over there. In this case, content authorization, your business logic, they can all live in these centralized locations and then they're all shared across all of these concerns. And even if you look over here, it's pretty faded out here, but uh, if you haven't experienced uh, working with a tool like Framer yet, Framer is a design tool that actually is backed by React. And so you can be prototyping and working with real-time data, actually demonstrating almost completely native content flows using real data. So for existing websites, you can add headless features slowly. You don't have to just swap it out right away. If you want to start the migration path to a headless CMS, you get the headless content set up, and then when you're adding a new page or maybe a new widget, you're able to feed content in slowly and, and carefully into your existing infrastructure. It doesn't have to be one big swoop. Uh, you can also migrate the data via API, which is a very, uh, very nice way to work. I've worked with a lot of importing of archaic data formats in the past, and when you can import data via API, it's, it's a game changer. And then it allows you to embrace new technology on your existing stack. You can actually shoehorn in things like React or Angular onto an application and get a lot of dynamic benefits uh, with an existing, existing site. For innovation, it allows you to use existing data. So you don't have to have this silo effect. You're able to embrace new technology. I mean, Flutter just came out with a whole bunch of new features. It's a, it's a mobile development platform. If you want to try it out, maybe there's something that's applicable for your business. If they added cool new camera features and you're like, well, that's actually applicable to my business, you can try out new technology right away using a headless CMS. And when you have well-documented APIs, and in the case of GraphQL, there's really nice benefits for discoverability. Uh, you can actually even generate your ideas by just looking at the available data. And for flexibility, content models change over time. I mean, having a field about can this car drive in a major German city wasn't really a question about three years ago, and now it's a realistic problem, or how far can this car go in a charge? Content models have to evolve over time, and if you're trying to version a whole bunch of APIs, or in one system you have the content updated, but now you have to update the MVP's content database too, having a centralized location allows you to, to work in a very flexible uh, process. This is an example of a GraphQL query, with just an example where you're able to say, centralized content hub, and then I can query the data that is specific to what I need. So cars where the car is electric, the model, and then the range uh, it's just uh, working with a centralized place gives you access to, to data in a very handy way. A couple of quick examples before I open up for questions. I think I'm crushing it on time, so we should have some question time. Uh, examples here. So this is not a customer of ours, Under Armour. I wish it was. They have sponsored my shoes today. <coughs> I, I bought them, but I call that a sponsorship. Um, 
I kind of laugh out of that. That was odd. Okay. Uh, so Under Armour, I mean, look at the, the spread of the various services they have to actually support now. So they've acquired these various apps, and the Moto, my, uh, not my fitness, my fitness pal. These are all apps that they've purchased that are now part of their data uh, network. This is their own initiative. Uh, I think it's the UA Health or Health Record, uh, their own uh, wearables and various services, which compete directly with their acquisitions. Don't ask me. Uh, microsites for special landing pages. If you ever want a good case study and, and microsites well done, <coughs> Under Armour is a great one for that. And then their existing e-commerce solutions. Having a centralized content hub for a customer like, like uh, Under Armour makes a lot of sense because you're able to then pipe in the data you're getting from your acquisitions, you're able to power your own initiatives, and you're able to, to rapidly iterate on microsites using new tools like Gatsby or whatever else to create very compelling experiences for your customers. Nike is actually doing exactly that, but they use a competitor of ours, so I'm not going to mention them out loud. Um, Discovery Channel is actually a customer of ours. They have a massive, massive presence online with all kinds of resources. This is the only project they actually have with us, but it's integrated directly into their main website. So this is the example where you don't actually need to completely rewrite your entire website if you want to start integrating with a headless CMS. You can simply even just have one subpage fetch data from a headless CMS. This is actually a customer of ours as well. This is a great case for uh, creating innovation inside of a company. K plus S uh, mines for salt. Like, cool. <laughs> I like salt. Um, but like, this is not the company you would expect to come out with the urban farming app for Berlin. And what they were able to do is taking the database of data they had, which actually incorporates a lot of agricultural data, they were able to mash it up into a new application and create the urban farming app for, uh, for Berlin. So a headless CMS really is a, a fantastic solution for crossing this bridge where you have existing data needs for websites and services and then the ability to actually uh, enable innovation inside of your company by letting that data be shared across, across concerns. That is actually all I have. So are there any questions? I explained it so well. One question. Do you have like example front ends, example heads as a product, maybe open source? Uh, we do, and fair, uh, quite a few headless CMSs will create boilerplate. Again, the idea is that they're minimal in structure because we want you to get up and running and actually map it to your real case business need. But yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How much time do I have left? <laughs> what's, my, what's my timer? Um, Seven what's that? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Oh wow, I rushed there. Okay, good. Uh, Can you repeat the question, please. Yeah, you want to know the difference between GraphQL and REST? <laughs> um, I have a slide deck for that. Uh, the the rough difference, and we can definitely talk more about it afterwards. Um, the rough difference between the two of them is that. GraphQL is a query language, and that allows you to actually descriptively fetch the data that you're requesting. True REST does have a lot of nice benefits. You can actually have, uh, I think they're called fragments inside of the URL, where you're able to request specific chunks of data and be able to, um, to, to fetch, fetch content. The problem is traditional REST implementations end up being that you have to create a stand-up endpoint for every single type of data you would want. GraphQL solves some of the problems that you have with REST, among them being uh, multiple round trips. So if you're trying to fetch products, you say, I want you know, 30 products, and you get back the product IDs. And then you say, well, I want the products and pictures, and you get the pictures, and then the title, and then the content, and you get a lot of round trips. And with GraphQL, you're able to write in a query, say, I want the products, plus the, the title, plus the content, plus the photo, and you get that content back in one go. Especially in the case of edge networks, it's very handy because if you're talking about brittle network connectivity, uh, you're not going to be having dropped uh, responses potentially. So if you get one response, you have the data. Uh, you also can be very descriptive in the context of that situation with the, uh, 
with the two hubs, so the, the visual hub and then the audio hub. You can say, I want to have just the restaurants without photos because that's megabytes of data that I don't need to be shipping down the wire. And in the case of the one with uh, photos, I can have it actually with the photos. So that's very roughly uh, some of the differences. GraphQL is just trying to solve some of the issues, when it, especially when it comes to clients asking for content uh, as opposed to you know server-to-server -server communication or whatever else. Any other questions? Any thoughts on Caspi? Love it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I mean, we're we're a front-end agnostic tool, right? So Headless is front-end agnostic. Gatsby is a fantastic way to get up and started. I gave a talk on it actually uh, last week. The benefit of Gatsby is that it gives you uh, very opinionated ways to get started with React. So React is a cool, li great library, but there's like 100 ways to write your router, 100 ways to write whatever. I mean, where to write CSS is a question today. Like, come on, like it's silly. Um, but Gatsby gives you very opinionated ways to build websites quickly. And I think it's great. Any more questions about this talk? <laughs> great. Well, if you have any questions, I will be out there uh, gulping coffee. So let me know. <laughs>